And I'm going to hand over to you, Claire Tyler to chair the meeting. Uh, thanks very much, Duncan. Uh, my, my name's Claire Tyler. Um, a very warm welcome to this Liberal Democrat History Group Fringe Meeting. Um, just to set the scene then for a minute, the, uh, the, the theme we're looking at today is the post-war welfare state beverage and the Liberal Party 75 years on. Um, and the context for the meeting is that this year, rather obviously, uh, marks the 75th anniversary of the 1945 general election and the beginning of the post-war welfare state. So along with measures to provide uh, free secondary education, uh, national health service, etc., cetera, uh, one other obvious, very important element of that was the introduction of a system of national insurance to extend a, a benefit safety net for the sick and unemployed. Now this system of social security is often referred to indeed heralded by historians and commentators alike as one of the greatest achievements of the Labour Party. Um, but as I'm sure uh, people attending this meeting know, its intellectual origins uh, stretch back over a number of decades and it was actually profoundly shaped by liberal thinkers and politicians, including David Lloyd George and William Beveridge. So uh, turning now to our speakers, it looks like our uh, second speaker may just be joining us, but I think, if I may, I will reverse the order of the speakers. Um, our, the, the two speakers we have are Professor Pat Thane, who is Professor of Temporary History at King's College uh, London, and also um, Dr Peter Sloman uh, from Churchill College, Cambridge, uh, and a member of Polis. So, I think, given that Pat, I think, is still trying to, to join us, hopefully we'll be there uh, in, in a few minutes. Peter, if it's OK with you, I'll reverse the order um, and invite you to speak first. That's absolutely fine. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. I hope everyone can hear me clearly in, uh, in, in this format. Um, I've learned a great deal from the history group over the years, and, and um, it's a In many ways, there is a, a great deal of irony um, around the result of the 1945 general election. Um, on one level, um, as, um, as Claire has said, the Liberals were at the heart of the development of the, of the post-war welfare state, and, and many of the ideas which shaped um, both full employment policy and, and social security policy during the 1940s came from liberals um, like John Maynard Keynes and William Beveridge and, and indeed Hello. like Roy Harrod and um, Robert yeah, yeah, sorry. Those who were involved in the in the policy making process in that yes. um, coalition. Oh. Um, at the same time. Um, the Liberal Party's campaign in, in 1945 yes, yes. Um, was a real failure. Uh -huh. um, despite putting William Beveridge... At the yeah, and, and that sort of blocked out and it won't, I can't... Uh, and um, basically uh, letting Beveridge run the campaign as, as MP for Berwick-upon-Tweed um, and putting Beveridge's picture on, on most of the parties. Uh -huh. um, the party went from 20... Right, so if I just... Speak. election. Can you hear me? Seats, um, and no, I can't see you. Them in, in rural yeah. Wales. I've just got a, a black and half screen in again. Bits of, of rural England. Oh. Um, and as Malcolm Baines, no, I can't. Out, uh, Pat, would yeah, sorry, the computer has worked on things like this before, but evidently not. I think I may have been able to mute Pat. I hope that's okay. Um, well, it won't okay, I hope everyone can hear me clearly away. clearly now. Yeah. Um, as Malcolm Baines has, point, has pointed out, um, 1945 yeah. was really the moment when the Liberal yeah, Party good, retreated to being a party of the Celtic fringe. And if you think about it, um, from the 1920s through to 1945, even though Labour was, um, had supplanted the Liberals as the main party of the British left, um, it wasn't clear that Labour could form a majority government in its own right. Um, the best Labour had done in, in 1929 was to be the largest party reliant on Liberal support. And, and in the 1930s, of course, Labour had gone pretty sharply backwards. So Liberals were able to argue during the interwar period that any kind of progressive alternative to Conservative government was going to require Liberal ideas and, and Liberal votes 
um, in order to be politically viable. Um, of course, with um, the 1945 Labour landslide, that argument became much harder to make. And, and so 1945 can be seen as the moment oh. in which the transition from being um, I can't see any of you, of course. Centre force and yes. uh, to, to being um, a relatively small political player. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the general context of the Liberal Party's engagement with Beveridge mm -hmm. and the Beveridge Report. Um, and then Pat, I think, is going to talk in more detail about what right. exactly William Beveridge proposed and how that built on the work of the, um, the Liberal governments the of the 19, um, 1905 to 1915 period. Peter, um, I the first thing I want to say... So could I just come in a minute and just ask if Pat, I think, is with us, if she could possibly mute herself, because I think some people are having difficulty hearing you. They're hearing noise in the background from, from Patricia. I'm sorry, uh, Claire, having Duncan here, we are having technical problems. She actually can't hear anything. And I have muted her on the screen, so you shouldn't be able to hear her, but you clearly can. I think in reality, we probably have to go ahead just with Peter. Is that OK? OK. I'm sorry, Peter. So, go. Thank you. The first thing I want to say in terms of context is that the Liberal Party was probably more divided intellectually over economic policy during the Second World War than at any other point in the 20th century. Um, if you think about it, this was a period where you had socialists ahead, like Cole, um, arguing that Britain should emulate the central planning really methods seen in, in the Soviet Union. The new um, for us, so and it needed to do that. Some problems with it. Um, in, really that it needed to do that in order to, to win the Second World War. Which you can speak. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you had free marketeers like um, like Friedrich yeah, Hayek, fault, um, arguing that well, Britain was going back. on the road to, to serfdom. And there were probably British liberal activists and liberal MPs even who could be found at, at each end of that rather wide spectrum. During the 1930s, um, after the 1935 election, um, Archibald Sinclair, as Liberal leader, had tried to develop a, a progressive agenda for the Liberal Party, which was nevertheless um, distinctively free market and, and built on the party's commitment to, to free trade. Um, so, um, for instance, um, the Liberals criticised the national governments very strongly for abandoning free trade in, in 1932. Um, and for subsidising agriculture and declining industries um, and pursuing um, forms of interventionist um, economic planning. Um, the Liberals also argued um, that they stood for um, dispersing economic power as widely as possible, rather than concentrating it in the hands either of the state or of large private companies. Uh, and so from this perspective, Labour's agenda was, was radically opposed to a genuine liberal one. Um, so for instance, in the 1938 report, Ownership for All, um, written largely by Elliot Dodds from, from Huddersfield, um, the party set out plans for breaking up monopolies, um, supporting small businesses, taxing inherited wealth, and it, so that it encouraged people to disperse their uh, their legacies as, as widely as possible, uh, and helping people build up their own economic assets. Really a vision of a kind of property-owning democracy. And if there had been a general election in 1939 or 1940, this would probably have formed the basis of the Liberal Party's campaign, alongside, of course, opposition to appeasement. But after the Second World War broke out, um, and particularly um, after Winston Churchill formed a coalition government in 1940, um, the political landscape changed very radically. Um, Archibald Sinclair and, and his allies within the party, um, people like Harcourt Johnson, um, who became MP for um, South Shields, I think, um, went into the Churchill coalition. And um, Archie Sinclair was very close friends with, with Churchill. They'd fought together in the Second World War. And Sinclair very much came to absorb the values and the preoccupations of the wartime coalition government. He, uh, as many of you will know, was Secretary of State for Air uh, and basically focused on, on running the RAF. At the same time, people like Clement Davis and, and Thomas Horobin um, effectively, who, who were uh, backbench Liberal MPs, effectively called for permanent government control of the economy and drew on advice from the Hungarian economist Thomas Bala, uh, who later became one of Harold Wilson's advisors in, in the 1960s. 
And their argument essentially was that Keynesianism was not enough, um, that in order to achieve um, full employment, in order to prevent a return to the mass unemployment of the Great Depression, the government needed not only to engage in um, the use of fiscal and monetary policy um, to prevent booms and slumps, um, but also to have substantial control over investment, um, which might involve in, um, regulation of, of private investment and um, the expansion of, of public ownership. And this provoked really bitter debates within the party at the 1920. Sorry, 1942 and, and 1943 Liberal Assemblies. So I think we have to set the emergence of the Beveridge Report in December 1942 in, in this context. Um, it's worth noting that, that William Beveridge, uh, even though he had been closely associated with the Liberals in, in the 1920s, was not at this point a member of the party. Um, he only joined in, in 1944 in order to fight the Berwick-upon-Tweed by-election. And um, as I think Pat will, will say if we, if we get the chance to, to hear from her, um, the Beveridge Report stood um, firmly in the tradition of social insurance, which Beveridge himself had, had helped develop with David Lloyd George and um, Winston Churchill before the First World War. Um, it unified the kind of patchwork of unemployment um, and, and, um, and widows and, and, and pension um, schemes. Um, that, that had developed um, over the previous 35 years and extended the social insurance principle to, to the whole of society. Um, I think there are two points that I would want to make here about how the Liberal Party responded to, to the Beveridge Report. Um, so the first is that even though social insurance was a liberal response to poverty and a, rec a recognisably liberal approach, um, it wasn't the only possible um, one. And um, liberals were actually quite well aware of, of its deficiencies. Um, so, for instance, many feminists pointed out that the social insurance model um, was based around a particular vision of um, male industrial employment um, in which most people had um, regular full time work and um, and social insurance was designed to tide them through periods of so-called interruptions of earnings um, when they didn't have the wages that were required to support their families. Um, and so arguably um, the Beveridge um, report was risked reinforcing a male breadwinner family structure um, which created forms of financial dependence within the family. Um, people like single mothers uh, or people who were disabled and never built up Social, social insurance rights through work and, and national insurance contributions um, were left to rely on the national assistance scheme, um, which was means tested and, and so potentially um, stigmatised and, and degrading. Seaburn Roundtree, um, who was still very much alive and kicking at this point, um, criticised Beveridge's um, idea of financing social security through flat rate social insurance contributions um, because he said, well, these are regressive. Um, people will pay, um, you know, everybody, every worker pays the same uh, social insurance stamp, as it was, as it was then called. And, and that was therefore a regressive poll tax on, uh, on workers. And as you might expect, there were some on the, on the sort of liberal right who worried that compulsory social insurance organised by the state risked crowding out forms of, um, of private and, and voluntary welfare provision. Now, as it happened, um, I noticed the Lib Dems adopted um, a commitment to universal basic income last night. Um, as it happened, um, the main alternative to the Beveridge Report canvassed within the party um, at this time was in fact a kind of quasi basic income proposal um, developed by Juliet Rees Williams, um, a liberal activist in, in Wales. Um, and I've got a copy here of the report which the, uh, the Liberal Party commissioned um, on Rees Williams' scheme, uh, chaired by Walter Layton, then the editor of The Economist newspaper, um, which said basically this could be quite expensive. Um, but the, the net cost is much smaller than the gross cost, uh, and, um, and I quote, um, it, it is sound in, in principle. Um, nevertheless, 
Um, that debate within the party over what kind of social security system would be best for Britain um, intersected with and I guess was overtaken by the wider political debate over the Beveridge report. Now, as many of you will know, um, when Beveridge submitted his proposals for social insurance, the Churchill coalition government, particularly the Conservatives and, and, and Treasury ministers, were keen to avoid making a firm commitment to the scheme because they wanted to be able to see how much money the, the, the country would have after the war. Uh, and they were worried about the risk of, uh, I guess, embedding the, the tax burden that had been um, that had been accepted during the war into um, the post-war period. Um, because they worried that, that those kind of taxes might impose uh, a heavy burden on, on industry. So in February 1943, when there was a parliamentary debate on the Beveridge Report, um, a Labour MP, uh, James Griffiths, put down a critical amendment, basically demanding that the, the government should implement Beveridge in full now. Um, and nine Liberal MPs, led by Percy Harris, um, MP for Bethnal Green, who was the chief whip, uh, and including David Lloyd George, who was actually making his last ever vote in the House of Commons, um, backed the Labour amendment, um, calling for immediate action. And this provoked a furious row um, with Sinclair and the Liberal ministers. Um, if you look at Percy Harris's diaries held at the Parliamentary Archives, you can see the real strength of feeling here. As he wrote in his diary a week after the debate, and I quote, I am convinced Liberals might well go out of business if they left care of beverage policy to Labour, as if they have stood for anything they have for the insurance principle. So in other words, Harris concluded that whatever the strengths or weaknesses of the, of the detailed proposals Beveridge was putting forward, the best political move which the party could make um, was to wrap itself in the mantle of Beveridge and say, this is a liberal policy. And in effect, that's what happened over the last couple of years of the war. Harris and other liberals who were outside the government, uh, like Violet Bonham Carter, um, basically drew Beveridge into the Liberal fold. They wined and dined him. They invited him to speak at party, party meetings. Um, they made him feel important. And in particular, they made him feel that he could have more freedom of action in the Liberal Party than if he had joined Labour. Um, the party um, basically shelved its interest in basic income because it made, made more sense politically to throw its weight behind Beveridge. And even in economic policy, the party adopted Beveridge's 1944 report on full employment in a free society as the basis of its post-war agenda. Uh, and this was really a highly interventionist form of Keynesianism. Uh, the argument was that if it was necessary, then the government might have to expand the field of public ownership. Um, in order to make full employment possible after the war, um, that there might need to be a national investment board to control um, private investment. Um, in other words, that fiscal and monetary policies would need to be backed up by some of the forms of central planning, um, which the Labour Party was generally more comfortable with. And um, so just as in 1929, the party had effectively seized on Keynes's proposals for conquer employment, for conquering unemployment as a kind of shortcut to electoral recovery, um, in 1945, it, it seized on Beveridge. But of course, this didn't really work. Um, and probably the most important reason was simply that the Liberal Party's organisation had deteriorated pretty badly. Um, since the 1935 general election. Uh, even though the party ran 306 candidates, um, so in contesting about half of all seats, it found it very difficult to um, persuade voters in most of the country that Liberal candidates had a good chance of winning. And if you think that the Liberals often benefit um, from localising the political contest and persuading people to focus on the constituency, um, this was much harder in the context of 1945, um, when men, many local parties had shut down during the war. Many people had been dislocated by um, wartime service or evacuation or going to work in, in war industries in other parts of the country. Um, so it was hard for Liberals to persuade people to focus on, on the local situation and, and the kind of tactical voting um, options that had been set up by, by the 1935 results. Another problem for the Liberals was that all parties promised to implement the Beveridge scheme. 
so even though liberals could say um, that this would be their distinctive contribution to post-war reconstruction, it was hard to argue that it wouldn't be implemented if people didn't vote for liberal MPs. And then finally, I think Labour's argument that economic planning was the essential foundation for social reconstruction um, seems to have resonated with many voters. And um, when Beveridge went to speak for Percy Harris and Bethnal Green Southwest during the campaign, Harris wrote a really interesting letter to him afterwards saying, basically, your speech was great and everybody's on board with you about the need for social security. But what they don't know is how the Liberals um, could deal with unemployment um, and, and Labour was able to persuade um, many voters that they could only have the kind of good things which, which all the parties said they wanted, um, social security, a national health service, better state education, better housing, um, if there were economic foundations which would make that possible, um, and that some form of planning which went beyond what liberals and conservatives were willing to support, um, or at least what conservatives and some liberals were willing to support, um, was necessary to, to make that happen. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I will hand over to Pat. Hello, Peter, can I just say thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. And the comments in the chat room just show how much people have enjoyed that. And, you know, people were saying fascinating insights, you know, really interesting parallels to what's happening at the moment. But thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now going to see if, if, if Pat, um, Professor Thain, is able to speak to us. I know she's been having a lot of problems and we may be able to hear from Pat, but possibly not actually see her. But let, let's just let's just see if it is possible for, for, for Pat to come in now. I'm not hearing anything from Pat yet. Um, Duncan, do you think that, I don't think anyone yeah. can hear Pat. No, you can't. Can you hear me? Yes, Pat, we can hear you now. Ah, yes, my microphone for some reason, yes. of course, it's still off. Now it's come on again. Okay, Pat, thank you so much. I know that you've been having enormous problems, so thank you so much um, for persevering. Um, we've had a fascinating <laughs> talk from Peter, and I wonder... I did manage to hear most of that yes. in the end. I Great. Can't... Um, if I could just, just introduce you formally as Professor of Contemporary History at King's College London, um, and could I invite you to, to make your contribution now, please? Okay, well, I hope you can hear it all. Uh, well, William Beveridge was closely involved with social policy from the beginning of the 20th century, when he was based on the Toynbee Hall settlement in East London and engaged in voluntary work in the district. And he remains strongly committed. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I need some water. He remains strongly committed to voluntary action by the better off to help the less advantaged as an essential component of a good, cohesive society. He was also very committed to ending unemployment and underemployment, that is the inability to get full-time work and pay, which he saw as the major causes of poverty at the time. In 1908, he was appointed advisor on employment to Winston Churchill, who was then a liberal and president of the Board of Trade. And Beveridge was responsible for introducing labour exchanges in 1909 to help unemployed people find work. Of course, they're now known as job centres and rather less supportive of the unemployed than Beveridge intended. In 1911, he was behind the introduction of unemployment insurance, the first scheme of its kind in the world. And in World War I, he advised the government on labour market matters and was behind the improved unemployment benefits after the war. Between the wars, he remained active on social policy, especially concerning unemployment, while he was director of the LSE. In the Second World War, he was appointed advisor to Ernest Bevin, the Minister of Labour, who, of course, was a Labour MP and a former trade union official. And his job was to advise on planning the wartime labour market. But 
But Beveridge bombarded Bevin with unwanted advice and criticism, behaviour of which he already had a bad reputation. And so desperate to get rid of him, Bevin had him appoint a committee the government had just set up to propose reforms to social insurance. And it was appointed because of growing criticism before the war, including from Beveridge, that the methods of providing old age pensions national health and unemployment insurance and other benefits had grown up since the beginning of the century in a very haphazard, no uncoordinated way. And early in the war, it became obvious they were failing to prevent severe poverty. Surveys revealed destitution among old people because the old age pension introduced in 1908 had never provided enough to live on. An evacuation revealed a deprivation of many urban children. So the committee was intended to propose ways to improve the system. But it wasn't thought very important by the government and had very vague terms of reference. And Beveridge was very disappointed by the uh, appointment because it seemed so unimportant. But he came convinced he could do something important with it. The other committee servants, busy members, were all civil servants who were too busy to give it much attention. So Beveridge took over and the 1942 report was essentially his work. And in this he proposed a comprehensive programme of state action to abolish want, as he called it, and associated social problems. He put this dramatically in the report, writing that along with social insurance reform, Britain needed, he wrote, an attack on want. But want is one of only five giants obstructing the road to comprehensive social improvement. The others are disease, ignorance, squalor and idleness. He used vivid language to draw attention to his ideas and he worked very hard to promote his ideas, including on the BBC and in newspapers. So he wrote that the five giants could be, could be destroyed by introducing a national health service to cure disease, universal good education, good affordable housing to abolish squalor, full employment to end idleness, improved social universal social security benefits and a family allowance for all children to provide, as he wrote, a safety net, protecting people from destitution from the cradle to the grave. He proclaimed all this because he was only appointed to reform social insurance. So the detailed report only concerned this, not the National Health Service and the other things which are outside his brief. But he made it clear that on its own social insurance reform wasn't enough and to eliminate want the poverty had to find ways to implement the other measures and these were covered by other wartime investigations and proposals. So he proposed in the report a unified system of national insurance providing old age and widows pensions unemployment, sickness, disability, maternity and other benefits for the whole working population in all classes, not restricted to manual workers like the previous systems, and also covering the non-working wide contributors. It'd be funded by contributions by workers, their employers and the state. He believed strongly that everybody contributed to their benefits. They'd be regarded as their right that they paid for and receiving benefits would no longer be a source of stigma. Claimants wouldn't now be regarded as feckless dependents on hardworking taxpayers. It was an attitude he was determined to get rid of. He believed if better off people received insurance benefits, they'd stop resenting paying taxes to help the poor and the system would promote social cohesion. The benefits should be high enough to cover all essential needs for food, housing, clothing, etc., providing enough to live on. But no more than that. He thought if people wanted a more comfortable life, they should save for it. 
Insisted benefits should be flat rate with flat rate contributions, not income related as in Germany and other schemes. Again, because he believes systems and no more. Married women not in paid work would get benefits by virtue of their husband's contributions. Beverly, they also would receive these by right, and he described them, as he put it, not as dependents of their husbands, but as partners, because he said they must be regarded and occupied on work which is vital, though unpaid, without which their husbands could not do their paid work without which the nation could not continue. This is Echo, those down the Rathbone, who's a friend of Beveridge, and also those of many women's organisations, who believe strongly that women's work in the home should be treated as work and respected like paid work, that is just as important. Rathbone developed the idea of family allowances, which Beveridge also proposed, as a means of the state paying women for their essential work at home. Beveridge didn't, as is sometimes suggested, believe married women should stay at home as dependents of their husbands in a male breadwinner welfare state. He recognised realistically that most married women had no choice but to stay home because there was a marriage bar, as it was known, which forced women to give up work on marriage in the professions and many other occupations. And that's all prevented by the difficulties of combining paid work and work at home and by the lack of affordable childcare. The marriage bar effectively died out during the war, but this wasn't obvious in 1942. So Beveridge was offering a realistic solution in this situation. He also proposed insurance allowances for divorced and separated wives and cohabiting unmarried wives, as they were known paid for by their partners or ex-partners' contributions. Also funeral allowances and universal state-funded family allowances. Also the old age pension should be paid strictly on condition of retirement from paid work at age 65 for men, 60 for women. Then with higher payments for each year work beyond the minimum age. Effectively, he was proposing a flexible retirement age, in order to encourage older people to keep working. And this was a result of another of his big concerns, which was the ageing of society. The birth rate had been falling since the late 19th century and life expectancy rising. And in the interwar years, there was a national panic about the ageing of society and the costs for a shrinking younger generation of supporting a growing older generation, kind of thing we've heard of quite a lot of in the last decades. Beveridge and Keynes both contributed to the pre-war debate about this, proposing among other things that where possible older people should work longer to lessen the burden on younger people. These concerns about the structure of the population wasn't Another reason for Beveridge's support for family allowances, the hope they might encourage people to have more families to have more children and, and sort of equalise the age structure. In fact, the birth rate was already rising in 1942, but it wasn't realised, leading to the post war baby boom, but it wasn't obvious when he was writing. He also proposed a new means tested system, national assistance, to replace the ancient poor law and provide for people who slipped through the net of social insurance and needed help. They expected the insurance system to be so comprehensive that not many people would need it. He was strongly opposed to means testing because it was stigmatizing, it was costly to carry out the tests and highly inefficient because in all known systems many people in need fail to apply because of stigma, stigma or ignorance of their eligibility, which is still true of means tested benefits internationally. Right, so the report immediately grabbed the headlines, partly because Beveridge worked hard to promote it. People queued up to buy it and within a month an unprecedented 100,000 copies were sold. 
be interesting to you know how many people actually read the 299 page very dense report which isn't easy reading the government's propaganda machine the ministry of information promoted it because they believed it could raise wartime morale by promising improved lives after the war and it's always been intended to reform the system after the war not during the war one person who wasn't enthused was churchill who tried to stop a summary of the report being circulated in the armed services but it had to give in because it was so popular so he never supported the proposals and hoped it could be shelved but as peter pointed out in 1943 there was a a parliamentary debate and backbenchers won the largest anti-government vote of the war for a commitment to implementing the report. Labour strongly supported it and the popularity of the report was one reason for their victory in 1945. But Labour then didn't fully implement the proposals. Um, as I think Peter was also suggesting, committees as they were to developing a welfare state they believed that reconstructing the economy came first. Like Beveridge, they believed that full employment and a successful economy were the keys to improving living standards, which have been Labour parties believed since its foundation. And after 1945, they did achieve economic growth and full employment. They introduced the health service and other measures, but they delayed full implementation of their welfare policies until the economy revived, hoping to stay in office long enough to fulfill their welfare plans. But of course, they narrowly lost the 1951 election to the Tories, and this didn't happen. So the result Dad, of the sorry, could I ask if you could start to draw your remarks to a close, because we've got quite a lot of questions piling up and, and not a lot of time left. Sorry. Many thanks. Right. Uh, well, the result was less comprehensive than Labour and Beveridge hoped. Um, benefits, especially pensions, weren't paid at the full subsistence level because uh, Labour couldn't afford it at that stage. And consequently, within a few years, over a million pensioners had to apply for a means tested supplement from national assistance. Family allowances also were not paid at the level he hoped and they didn't eliminate child poverty, as he hoped. And also, um, there was, was an addition if people worked longer than the uh, minimum age, but it was very small. No allowances were paid to do unmarried partners because of protests that this would encourage immorality. So the report was not fully implemented. Beveridge wasn't consulted about implementation to his great annoyance. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. And thank you for persevering, because I know you've had you've had really quite a struggle to get in. It was great to have your contribution yeah. as well. And well, well I'm two you're able to hear it. Yes, the, the two contributions were very complimentary. Um, We've got a lot of questions. I just want to try to pose a, a few of them. Peter, could I could I ask you a question from Mark Mills? Is to what extent can we draw a line between the historical liberal economic thinking uh, with that of present day Lib Dems? Gosh, that's a very big question. Uh, it is, <laughs> and um, there's not much time. <laughs> I think what I would say on, on, I mean, in terms of the Liberal Party during this period um, is that the 1940s was a period where Britain's entire relationship with the world economic system was, was in flux. Um, you know, Liberals had been committed up to 1931 to what we would now see as a pretty um, doctrinaire view of free trade, absolute free trade, unilateral free trade. Um, and, and during the 1930s and 1940s, that went into retreat. Um, and in, in a sense, what's so striking is not that that was divisive among liberals, but that they got over it so easily uh, and came to terms with the degree of um, state intervention and, and management in the economy that, that emerged. Um, and I think that the fact that people like Keynes and Beveridge were involved in that process smoothed that, that transition um, at the time. Of course, what's interesting now is that we are back in an era where issues of trade, uh, agricultural support, 
um, and, and, and so on are going to be back on the political agenda. Um, I suspect most Lib Dems are, are still in the kind of Keynes beverage place of um, social liberalism in, uh, and, a, and a commitment to the mixed economy and, 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 and so on. Um, but um, yeah, um, I think the, the thing I would say is that we have to be careful not to draw lines um, too neatly between different periods, but to recognise that the, the economic context is, is very different. Thanks very much indeed. Pat, did you want to come in on, on that one at all? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add. No, and, and Pat, one, one uh, perhaps more aimed to, in, in you is a question we've had from Faith uh, about how, the stigma you talked about, about how much, how much is that stigma still with us? And she uh, relates various examples from her own family, uh, history of people with disabilities and others, you know, being made to feel uh, really awful by by tribunals and things like that. Well, I've no doubt the stigma has come back very seriously ever since the 1980s. It did somewhat diminish. I think people did get have that sense beverage wanted of having a right to their benefits, and that was encouraged for quite some time. But the feeling of stigma that you know all claimants are kind of feckless. Um, Fecklessly you know, taking advantage of hard-working taxpayers. I think it's just become stronger and stronger and it's very depressing. Right. No, thank you very much. Um, a couple of two questions. I might pose them both and you might decide which one you want to answer because I think they're both very relevant to this meeting. The first one from Riyadh is what lessons can be learned from the beverage report for the modern Liberal Party? Um, and the slightly more historical one from Robin is what was the reaction of the Liberal Party to their performance in the 1945 election? Peter, do you want to go first? Well, I think Peter can do the second one. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, I'll answer the second one. Um, it's interesting that I, I was reading yesterday when I was preparing for this a letter from um, Joe Grimmond, who had been a Liberal candidate, I think, in the election, um, to Philip Fothergill, uh, later party, party chairman, which was written between the votes being cast and polling day. And um, because because in, in that between the votes being cast and, and the results coming out and Grimman said oh we, we've done pretty well in this campaign well we, we probably will win between 15 and 40 seats and the thing we need to do is to build on the direction that Beveridge has shown us uh, as a party um, to build on his commitment to full employment and social security and kind of put the liberals at the heart of political debate but of course when the results came out it became clear that that the results had really been really poor and um, the party um, it, most of the, the party's kind of big thinkers as MPs had, had, had lost their seats or, or failed to get into Parliament. Um, and Clement Davis, um, I think he was accepted as leader, but he was never particularly respected um, by, by some of his parliamentary colleagues um, and kind of struggled to set uh, an intellectual direction for the party. So I think the party largely took refuge in saying that basically the problem is organisation. And as some of you will know, in 1950, the party tried to run almost 500 candidates uh, to tell people that if they wanted a liberal government, they could vote for one um, and, and hope against hope that as the pendulum swung back against the Labour government, it would stop with the liberals rather than going all the way to the conservatives. Um, but of course, that, that was a political disaster. Um, the party lost most of its deposits and fortunately it had insurance with Lloyds of London to, uh, to pick up the bill for that. Um, but I think the party really struggled to come to terms um, with how to how to fight a, a successful Labour government and of course a Labour government which in power uh, managed to deliver on the welfare state and deliver full employment um, and there's a case for saying it was only really in the 1960s uh, and 1970s that the Liberals really got their heads around um, how to compete in that new political environment. Thanks very much. Did, did you want to come in at all Pat? Uh, not on that one, no, again. No, okay. Um, and there's so many questions now, I can't really put them all. No. Can I just, as perhaps as a way of help to offer you an opportunity to sort of wind up your comments, um, do you feel that there is the need for a modern day uh, beverage report? And Pat, I don't know if you, from a more historical perspective, if you could say what role beverage had in relation to the formation of the NHS. 
but Peter, modern modern day yeah. modern day uh, beverage report. Do we need one? Well, the second one, he didn't have anything to do with the formation of the NHS. A lot of other people have been advocating it, right. and it was very much an Aaron Bevins. In response to one of the comments, though, the Tory party was very divided about it, and a large group wanted to privatise it when they were in government. Um, sorry, what was the other point about? Well, well, the, well, the other one was about, you know, is, do oh, we need, do well, we need, do we need a need beverage report? Yeah. I think we definitely do, because the levels of poverty shown by all the res respectable research organisations like Roundtree and the IFS, they're just hugely alarming. The use of food banks, the extent of homelessness, and it's clearly getting worse yeah. during the COVID crisis. And so something we do need a really very profound rethink of how we solve those problems. I was pleased to see that the Lib Dems have gone for UBI, which strikes me as a good start. Um, and I, I, I think, yeah, we do need something yeah. as profound as beverage, because right, we're you. in a very bad mess at the moment. Thank you very much, Pat. And that's very much borne out by some of the comments we've received. Um, uh, Peter, could I ask you to make any sort of, you know, concluding points you'd like to make? Um, I mean, I suppose, that on the question of, of of do we need a new beverage report i what it, what of course is striking about the, the second world war is that the government could consider giving um an outsider um the power to um to put a report like that together um, and then allow it to to gain political traction in, in that kind of way um i think nowadays the chance of um the welfare state being reconstructed um on a, on a kind of comprehensive basis is, is difficult to imagine just because there are so many uh, experts in, in, in so many different fields within, within government departments. Um, and of course, this Conservative government takes such a deeply partisan, politicised approach to, to social policy. Um, but I think it does show how, how Liberals can have influence on, on policy making, even when um, the Liberal Party, perhaps even the Liberal Democrats now, are not in a position to, um, to command um, quite as many votes or quite as many seats as, as they might like to. Right. Well, look, thank you so much to both of you. But two absolutely fascinating presentations, a lot of really interesting detail, insights. As I say, I thought they were very complimentary, the two presentations. I can just see from the questions in the comments how interested people were. And I'm sorry I could only pick out some of the questions that came in. People have been asking whether this session will be sort of recorded or uh, written. I think Duncan has said that there will be a write up in the next journal. And I think that, that this recording of this whole session will be available at some point. I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, when. So thanking uh, our two speakers hugely and particularly Pat for sort of persevering. Thanking everyone who's listened and all, all the great questions and comments. And perhaps I could ask people to visit the uh, the history group's um, exhibition booth. Um, I think you'll you'll see a short video there about the group. Um, and during the times uh, when the exhibition is open, I think that there's uh, live interaction, so you can have chat with people from the uh, history group. Um, you know about future plans and things like that. Um, Duncan, could I just ask, is there anything else you want you want to say before before we wind up all together? No, the only other thing I was going to say was uh, to thank both of our speakers and to everyone who's attended and also thank you, Claire, for chairing so well uh, in our slightly technologically challenged environment. Well, 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 well thank you, Duncan. And um, I think it's been a great <laughs> session. I mean, yes, it's all a bit challenging te technology. I think we've all had experience of this in the last day or two. We're all learning, but you know, I just think the content and the substance has been fantastic, and I've really felt I've I've learned a lot, and it's given me some some really interesting things to think about. So, thank you to our speakers, thank you to everyone who's attended, and to you, Duncan, for organising. So, I'll I'll say goodbye now.